All right, here goes. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. This is the start of a two-part series where I'm going to make a pair of these Toolmaker's clamps. This is a classic machinist tool. It's a very old design, but it's as good today as it was 100 years ago. And it's a great uh, project for the home hobby machine shop. Let's get started. In my research and a whole bunch of old books on the subject, I found that there's basically one main design for these toolmaker's clamps. It looks like this. So there's a clamping screw at the front, and then the back is actually just a pivot screw. So it's in a blind hole, and it's acting like uh, the back support on a strap clamp. And uh, this is uh, pretty straightforward and easy to make. So this is what I set out to do. Now there's another common design, and it looks like this, where the two thumb screws are both threaded through, and it's basically a double clamping action. And then uh, there's a, a clearance relief on the back screw for some sort of clip or nut or uh, some way to hold the screw in place. And both these designs utilize a spring clip at the top to hold that knob in place. A reasonable question at this point is, why aren't the clamps simply symmetrical? Why use this spring clip arrangement to retain one knob and then a recessed e-clip or nut or other arrangement on the other knob. All of the designs that I looked at did this, and none of them explained why, but my best guess is to maximize the clamping surface available at the front of the jaws between the tip of the jaw and the screw there. If you had some sort of a recess in there, then that would interfere. But then on the rear knob, you don't need that area for clamping, and it's just a simpler construction method. Models and drawings for both of these clamps will be on my Patreon, so go ahead and check that out. Now, why did I model and make drawings for both designs? Well, we'll get to that. I'm going to make a pair of these clamps because usually you need clamps in pairs, and by the time you're setting everything up anyway, making two of each part is really not much extra work. I'm going to make the jaws first, and I'm going to use 4140 steel. If you're a longtime viewer of the channel, you may recognize this as the material that I bought on eBay, which was labeled as 1018 steel, and then burned up a cutter because it was clearly a whole lot tougher than that. So it's going to be just the thing here. Now, I need to get four jaws for the two clamps out of this little piece here. So I'm going to chop a chunk off on the horizontal bandsaw, and then I'm going to do something uh, maybe ill-advised. I'm going to split it down the middle with the bandsaw so that I can get my four jaws out of this one piece. So I've scribed a line down the center, and I can't hold it in the vise this way, so I'm using the slot that the vise jaw rides in for a T-slot, and I'm clamping it in place, and then I'm doing my best to line it up and tappy tappy tap it in on the saw blade. Now, I don't really know if this is going to work. This is maybe not the greatest idea, but amazingly, this seemed to be going very, very well. But something really interesting happened near the end. Did you see that? The part sprung. So there was some kind of crazy internal forces there that got released when this cut was made. And that's going to be interesting later on. But for now, the saw seemed to have made a really great cut. Honestly, these parts are very, very close to being identical. And uh, end to end there actually within a thou on uh, the cut, so that's entirely luck that I happened to get it that well aligned on the saw blade, but hey, I'd rather be lucky than good every day. Now I need four identical blanks for the four jaws, so I'm going to set this up here and square up the stock, and uh, you'll notice I'm using a copper wire there on the movable jaw instead of my usual piece of round bar. I've had people suggest this, and I wanted to give it a shot, so uh, here we are, and actually uh, I like it. I think, uh, I think I might start using this as my go-to for uh, cancelling out the influence of the movable jaw against an unmachined surface. This is just the standard method I use for squaring up stock. If you want to know all the details about what I'm doing here, check out my mill skills playlist where I have a dedicated video on squaring up stock. But the TLDR is you machine one side, put that side against the fixed jaw, and rotate it around keeping the machine surfaces against the fixed jaw as you go. And uh, deburring between each step here, I'm using this little Noga tool. Here on the second to last surface, something interesting happened. The milling cutter drifted off the surface there, and so it looks like there is a pretty substantial bend in there. So I put a light and a straight edge on there, and sure enough, this thing is a banana. And we saw this earlier when it sprung on the saw. So I flipped it over such that the stems of the banana, if you will, are facing downwards, and then I touched off on the high spot, which is in the middle, and then I proceeded to machine just enough off such that it cleaned up end to end and that should take the bend out of this side and so now i've got like a skateboard ramp it's flat on the bottom but the other side of this part is going to be curved downwards so then i flipped it over and you can see 
how now I am able to clean it up with a very light pass. So this appears to have succeeded in taking that banana out of it. Okay, I'm aiming for 400 thou, so let's see how we did. Ooh, that is YouTube perfect. Now let's uh, go ahead and look on the honesty scale up here, and okay, we're three tenths over, so I'm gonna take that. So there's our blank after doing the remaining side. We haven't done the ends yet, but that's okay. So there is blank number one, and it's gonna have two jaws come out of that. And then I did all of that again, and there's blank number two that's gonna have the other two jaws. Now I'm gonna split these apart and make four blanks. So I'm gonna mark the rough center of each here. I've got about half an inch of extra stock on both of these parts, so we don't have to be crazy precise here. There's our little scribe marks, and I'm just gonna chop those off with the portable bandsaw. And now I have four jaw blanks with rough cut ends. So my next task is going to be to square up one end and bring them to length. I'm using my thin parallels here because I'm also gonna be using this setup for some drilling later. So I'm setting up the first blank here and it doesn't matter where I put it in the vise because I'm just getting one side flat as a reference for the overall length. And of course, tap, tap, tap that in. And I'll mill that end flat. And then I swap that out and swap the next one in. So I'm milling one end of all four blanks flat. Then I deburr those four ends and now I'm setting it up with the machined end to the right in the vise. And I'm making sure that I have the three inches of length that I'm gonna need without hitting the vise. And now I'm establishing some coordinates. So I'm edge finding on either side to get a center line using the half function on the DRO. And then I edge find on the end and then move in the radius of the edge finder. So now I have a zero point that's on center line at one end. And then I put an end stop in here, so this will be repeatable. And now I can move the table down three inches, which will be the length of my part, plus the radius of my cutter, which puts me at three, 375. And now if I mill that off, the part will be perfectly on length. However, that would be too big a cut. So instead what I do is I switch over to incremental on the DRO and I zero the X right there and then I can move the cutter back, touch off, and now when I look at my DRO, you can see that's how much I have to remove. So if I just mill down to zero and however many passes I needed, I'm gonna be back on the 3, 375 mark that I had on the absolute scale. Great trick with the incremental on the DRO. And now I can swap out, use my end stop, and do all the other pieces to that exact same position on the DRO, and they're all gonna be the perfect length and the same length. Now without moving anything, I'm gonna spot the three holes that the top jaw needs because I still have my coordinate system referencing from the one end there. I do both top jaws and then I also spot the two holes for the both bottom jaws. And now I can switch out to my clearance drill size. Whoa, 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 whoa. I actually just made a pretty big mistake. You recall at the beginning I said I had set off to make uh, what's called the type one clamp with the blind hole. But look what I just did, I put three spots on one side of the top jaw. That's not actually right. One of those spots should have been on the underside because that hole is blind from the below. So I went off and had a good sulk and that's when I went back to the books and I found the type two clamp that has through holes on the top jaw. So I was able to salvage the work that I had just done. So I switched to making what I'm calling the type two clamp at this moment and well, here we are. Each of the jaws has a clearance hole and a threaded hole on opposite sides. So this is the clearance drill for the thread that I'm using on these thumb screws is a 1228. And uh, it would just happen to be the perfect size for the jaws that I could make from the size of material that I had. Quarter 20 was gonna be too big and number 10 was gonna be too small. So a little bit of an unusual size, but I'm uh, clearance drilling for 1228 at one end and drilling for the tapping size at the other. And the two top jaws also have a little 832 blind hole in them for the little bolt that holds the clip in place. With all my holes drilled, I can switch to my spring-loaded tap follower and do a whole bunch of tapping. So I'm tapping again 832 in the middle for that little mounting bolt and just doing a little test fit there. That looks good. And then I switch out to my 1228 tap, which uh, I actually had to uh, special order for this project because, well, 1228 seemed like a great thread to use in CAD and then realized I don't actually have that tap. 
The reason that I went with 1228 instead of the more common 1224 is because I thought a finer pitch thread was a good idea for something that's going to be clamping like this, gets you more leverage. And then with all of those holes tapped, drilled, and clearanced as needed, I went in with the Noga tool and deburred everything. So far, so good. Now we're going to put the taper on the end. For that, I'm going to use my angle blocks, which always stay in place in the box. Her imperial fist shake. Now, every time I show this, Somebody inevitably comments, why don't you just put an extra piece of foam or something in the box? And well, the answer is obvious, because then it wouldn't be funny. Anyway, why do I need to when I can just do this? Okay, so I'm setting up with a 20 degree angle block here, and I'm just going to touch off on the top there, and then I proceed to mill this down. I'm doing 30 thou passes. I'm being pretty conservative because I don't want to risk shifting this in the vise. Knowing when to stop when milling a taper can be a little bit tricky. If it's something critical, there's, you know, a bunch of trigonometry you can do to get it precise. But for something like this, where it's mostly aesthetic, here's a couple of low precision ways to do it. One is just to try to catch the very edge of it with the micrometer and check that against the drawing. Another way is to just use your machinist scale and measure the thickness. That's often easier than the micrometer. Or you can also measure the top size of that surface. And I like to mark that what's called an aligned dimension on the drawing so that I can easily measure that and know when I'm basically there. In this case, it's more important that the four tapers be the same rather than being a specific dimension. So I made this setup repeatable. I've actually got an end stop on the angle block. You can just see out of frame there a little bit. And then I'm aligning the end of each jaw with the edge of the vise using a parallel or whatever handy flat thing is lying around. So if the stock is aligned and the angle block are both aligned, then I know I can mill down to the same reading on the quill DRO. And just like magic, we end up with two identical tapers. I, I mean, it's not magic, it's math. Stay in school, kids. And deeper, deeper, deeper. And now we have four lovely looking jaws, two bottoms and two tops. And we are ready for the next step. Waka, 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 waka. One last little detail is I need to set these guys back up flipped over so that we can mill a little recess on the back of the lower jaws. And that's clearance for the little E-clip that holds this knob in place. Next, I'm going to make the little clips that hold the knobs in place. I'm going to make them out of spring steel and shim stock is a great source of that. So I have some 15 thou shim stock here, which is going to work great. I'll get some die cam on there and I'm going to mark out the dimensions for the two pieces that I want. So they're 350 wide and a little over one inch long. These don't have to be crazy precise. So I'm just doing layout here and uh, I'll machine these by eye. So I'm rough cutting them out with a diamond blade on the Dremel tool. Remember spring steel is quite hard. So we have to be thinking about it as more of a grinding operation than a cutting operation. I am going to mill it, however. Stefan Gotswinter did a video for Tip Splits 2019 where he talked about working with spring steel. And uh, one of the things he mentioned is that you can machine it uh, if you use carbide end mills and uh, light passes and lots of speed. So that is what I'm going to do here. I've got an eighth inch carbide end mill in there. And I have to say this is machining actually extremely well. I definitely wouldn't want to take too much of a cut here, but because the part is so thin, I can't use a parallel, so I'm literally just lining it up with the top edge of the vise and my layout lines by eye. And uh, yeah, let's see, I got it to actually within uh, a thou end to end. It's about five thou oversized, but within a thou uh, end to end. So I'm happy enough with that. I'll deburr it with a stone, not a file, because once again, spring steel is pretty hard. And then I made two of these little blanks, and now I'm laying out for the hole and the slot that these parts need. I'm not going to center punch these because that's going to be a little hard on my center punch, frankly, and uh, it's very thin material, so that might tend to deform it. Instead, I'm using a sharp chamfering tool, it's carbide, and I'm turning it by hand to just make a little divot, and I can adjust the table until that divot lands exactly on my layout lines. 
Now you can't really drill spring steel with high speed steel drills. Uh, there is a technique that Stefan showed in his video, which I'll link to below for how to do it, but it does chew up the drill. So instead I'm using a carbide four flute end mill. Uh, Stefan mentioned that a ball nose end mill is actually a great way to drill uh, spring steel, but I don't have one in the right size. So I used a four flute and actually it worked fine. And then for the slot at the other end, I'm just milling in from the end, nice slow feed, lots of speed. And again, this worked really well. And we'll clean up our toys and let's see how that turned out. Looks very good. You can see that our slot is not quite on center there, but that's okay. It's certainly good enough for YouTube. Next, I needed to put this 100 thou dog leg bend in it. Now, you could grab some pliers and do this by hand in about 27 seconds, or you could spend two hours doing what I'm about to do. I wanted to try stamping these parts, so I grabbed some steel to make a die. I milled a 15 thou pocket on one side, and I milled an 85 thou pocket on the other, so that's 100 thou of dog leg minus the thickness of the material. And then I uh, deburred that guy. And then I decided it uh, really needed an angled uh, slope in there, so I took a chamfering mill in there to put a 45 degree transition in there. Then it was clear I was going to need a symmetrical part for the other side of this die, so I just took it back to the mill and finished off my cuts all in the same places. And then I took it to the porta band and just sliced it right down the middle. And now I have two perfectly symmetrical parts that will form a lovely stamp. Now I figured the two pieces of this die need an alignment pin of some sort, so I'm uh, spotting for a 3 8 hole here. And the idea is that uh, the, I'm going to put a pin in here that's the same diameter as the hole that is in one end of the clips. So that will hold the clip in place and align the dies, and it will establish the draw direction for the material as it stamps. So one end is going to be held in place by this pin, and then it's going to draw the material from the other end as it clamps downward. And then leaving a gap there where the sloped areas meet for the material to live in, I aligned the two halves of the die and then transfer punched that hole and then just drilled that out the same way. Over to the lathe now to make my pin. I grabbed a piece of 3 8 drill rod. I keep drill rod around in lots of common sizes because it's super useful for little things like this. So it saves me having to machine a pin. I just have to clean up and chamfer the ends and uh, we have a pin in just a couple of minutes. Flip it around, do the same on the other end, and we have a lovely little pin. Now this is the less expensive medium precision drill rod, so the diameter of it can vary by half a thou. So for that reason I keep over under pairs of reamers around. In this case my hole is a hair too small for the pin to slide in there. So I just uh, take a half thou out of there with an oversized reamer. Now the pin slides in there perfectly. And I could have pressed it in, but I didn't want to risk damaging something here on this uh, little die. And so instead I'm going to lock tight the pin in place. So before I do that, I got to acetone everything, get all of the grease and oil off of it. And then that Loctite will stick on the pin. I'm using Loctite 603 here, which is good from a light press fits all the way up to about a four thou clearance fit. And you can see how the clips are going to slide down over the alignment pin. And then the other half of the die will slide down on that pin. And then in principle, if I swoosh that together, I'm going to have a perfect clip. Over to my arbor press now, and I'm going to do my best to carefully align everything here. Again, ultimate precision is not critical here. This is mostly aesthetic. You certainly don't need a two-ton arbor press for this, but I just like an excuse to use this thing. All right, here goes. Moment of truth. Oh, that was so satisfying. Oh my gosh, that felt fantastic. Let's get a look at that clip there and see if that actually worked. My goodness, that turned out nice. Look at that. That is just perfect. It drew the material in from the slotted side just like I wanted. The bends are perfect. Wow, I am shocked at how well this worked, honestly. I've never done something like this before, so this was all made up as I went along. So I did the other one the same way, and this worked so well, I kind of almost wish I had a hundred of them to make because I've got a perfect uh, setup now to do this over and over again. The last parts to make are the thumb screws, and they are a pretty complex part, and unfortunately I don't have time to show them to you in this video, so stay tuned next week for the thumb screws. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.